Church, good morning. How are we doing? 930. Yeah, we alive and well after that baptism celebration, church. Hey, pretty awesome, right? God's moving in our midst. Amen, church? Oh, come on. God's moving all around us. Amen? Hey, this is awesome. This is awesome. Hey, uh, if we have not gotten a chance to meet before, my name is Alex. I get the absolute privilege and, and honor of serving on staff as one of the pastors here at Fellowship, and I serve on the teaching team as well, and so I love getting an opportunity to present God's Word to you. We're going to continue in our Romans series. We're going to be in Romans 10, starting in verse 14. We're actually going to finish out chapter 10 this morning, and, and last week we really talked about, okay, the gospel is the simple message. So the question that we asked is, okay, if the gospel is so simple, why are there so many people in Paul's day and so many people in our day that have not believed the gospel? Well, we found out that the gospel is simple to understand. It's not so easy to accept because of human pride. That's, that's one of the big reasons. And this week, we're going to discuss another reason why people here maybe don't believe the gospel, or don't hear and can't call upon his name. So let's pray, and then we'll dive right into God's word. Jesus, we love you. We are so thankful that we just get to witness front row of all the ways that you're moving in individual lives throughout southwest Missouri and the world. Lord, I pray that my words would be your words from your perfect word, the Bible, we pray that uh, there'd be people in our, that are midst in, in this room that would really feel the weight of what it means to be used in your plan of more and more people coming to know you. I pray if there's people that have yet to call on your name and they've heard the gospel time and time again that you would just melt their heart. You would pierce their heart with truth because we believe in the power of the gospel. I ask this boldly to be true in your name. Amen. Well, Admiral Jim Stockdale was the highest ranking officer in the United States military, and he was in the Hanoi Hilton prison during the Vietnam War. Uh, he was held captive as a prisoner of war from 1965 to 1973 for seven and a half years. Man, he, he outlived the, the Vietnam War. They kept him there. There was no release date in sight. There was certainly no guarantee that he would survive or ever be reunited with his family ever again. If there was a hopeless situation, it would clearly be Stockdale's situation. Jim Collins, he's the author of the book Good to Great, he, he stumbled upon Stockdale's story. And as he was reading it, it was an autobiography. He knew the end of the story. Like he knew Stockdale came out of, from captivity. He was, he was freed. He was reunited with his family. He survived. He knew those things here. But as he's reading this story, he just couldn't help but feel that, that sense of hopelessness and even depression as he was reading this book. He finally got to sit down with Stockdale. He asked him the question, hey, how did you deal with this? Like, like how did you live as a prisoner? For seven and a half years, like I knew the end of the story, and it was overwhelming for me to read about how did you walk through that, not knowing what the other side was going to look like. You see, it was recorded that 114 soldiers died in captivity during this time. Admiral Stockdale could have easily been one of those people. and He answered Collins, and he said that I never lost faith in the end of the story. As a follow-up question, Jim Collins asked Stockdale, well, who are the type of people that didn't make it out? Like, could you explain those sorts of people to me? And he says, oh, that's easy. They were the optimists. They were the people that said, oh, uh, we'll definitely make it out by Christmas time. Don't worry. We'll just, we'll hang in there until Christmas. Christmas would come. Christmas would go. And they'd still be in captivity. Or they, they'd say, well, Easter, for sure. They got to free us by then. Easter would come and go. And then Thanksgiving, and then Christmas, year after year, they would say, hey, like, it's got to be this time. And Collins, or excuse me, Stockdale said that these people died of a broken heart. And Stockdale left us with a very important lesson that you must maintain unwavering faith that you can and you will prevail in the end regardless of the difficulties that you're facing at that time and have the discipline 
to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. In other words, Stockdale is saying, hey, to have a, a vision of, of a preferred future, hey, that's great. Hey, that's awesome. But that's going to be only so helpful as, as your reality of the present brutal facts that are presented before you. Because if you have this grand vision without facing the brutal facts, you're not going to be able to take steps of faith. And the vice versa is true. If if you're only just looking at the brutal facts and there's no hope of anything ever changing, there's not a preferred future or change in sight, then you'll die of a broken heart like these prisoners in Vietnam. This paradox of leadership has actually been coined the term Stockdale's paradox, and it applies to really all areas of life. Take the business world, for example. Take your professional life. Like if, if you're a business owner and you want to increase sales by 30%, that's, that's great. Like, like that's a measurable goal. That's probably tangible. Like that's pretty clear too. But unless you have a brutal reality and face the facts of your company's strengths and, and weaknesses and industry opportunities, maybe potential threats that are going to keep you from seeing sales increase, you aren't going to see that 30% sales increase goal made manifest. Or take it personally into a personal application, right? Like I can say all day long, I want to be a more sacrificial husband and a present husband to Mary Kay. But unless I ask her what my mentor told me to ask her, which is this, Mary Kay, what do you experience when you're in my presence? Like, how do you actually feel whenever you're around me at home? Whenever we actually face the brutal facts, like I'm actually able to make adjustments and and changes and commitments to become more of a sacrificial husband, more of a present husband at home. This also has some spiritual application as well. Here in our passage, Paul's embracing really the Stockdale paradox. As a spiritual leader, he's saying, hey guys, remember, we've got this grand vision of what heaven is going to look like, because the gospel, it's for Jews and Gentiles. And yet he's not afraid to face the brutal facts of the reality that are going to keep the church at Rome and the church in Rogersville from seeing that vision come to fruition. And in essence, really, Paul is saying that church, you must maintain unwavering faith that God can and will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties and at the same time, have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current spiritual reality, whatever they may be. And here's why this is important for us this morning, okay? Because Paul's vision to see everybody have an opportunity to call upon the name of Jesus is God's vision, and that's also our vision here at Fellowship. If you're new or you've been attending for a while, you need to know what Fellowship is about. This is our grand vision. It's God's vision. It's right there on the wall of the, the coffee bar. We desire to see every person together following Jesus, engaged where they live, and involved around the world. Like our vision is God's vision. So that means that unless we face the brutal facts that Paul lays before us, we're not going to be able to see every person together following Jesus. We're not going to see Southwest Missouri and the world changed for the sake of Christ. And so we got, we got to see what Paul has for us here in Romans 10, starting in verse 14. God's word, it reads like this. He asks the question, how then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? How are they to believe in whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And How are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed, excuse me, he says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their vo- voice has gone out through all the earth, their world, words to the end of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and a contrary people. 
Here in this passage, Paul lays before us two brutal facts that we're, that we're forced to face this morning, but an unwavering faith and hope that we can cling on to here this morning. So first, the brutal fact that we've got to face is that people have not believed because they have not heard. People have not believed and, and called upon the name of Jesus because they don't know who he is. This is what 14 and 15 are talking about. Uh, Paul's saying that, hey, how can you expect them to call on the name of Jesus in, in a name that they've never even heard of? And, and verse 17 is, is saying that faith comes from hearing the word of Christ, the gospel. And, and this is the gospel. It's that Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, came from heaven to earth to live a sinless life. Like a perfect life that you and I are incapable of living because of our sin. Because we've sinned against a holy, perfect, and just God. Like what we deserve because of that is, is death. Like that's the punishment and penalty that, that we deserve. And yet Jesus went to a Roman cross 2,000 years ago sacrificially. And, and he died for us. He paid and endured that punishment and penalty that we deserved. He took away sin. He, he lifted shame from our shoulders whenever he rose from the dead on that third day, proving he was who he said he was this whole time, the true son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, that no one gets to the Father except through him. And so whenever we know this, we have this opportunity then to trust Christ's work, not ours. We get to treasure his costly sacrifice, and it was costly. And then we get a chance to surrender to him as the only leader in the whole universe that can lead us into eternal life with the Father. That's what it means to hear the gospel and respond to the good news of the gospel. And in Paul's day, it was this Gentile community that didn't know or understand or have access to this message or this person, Jesus. You see, they didn't have... Um, uh, the Jewish law, they didn't have the glory of God, they didn't have the, the temples, the way of worship, they didn't have the covenants that God exclusively made with the people of Israel, they didn't have all these prophecies that foretold like a savior of the world coming. In our day, the comparable people group that, that maybe we could compare these people to would be people in this area called the 1040 window. The 1040 window here on the screen is, is 10 degrees north latitude and 40 degrees north latitude. And inside this rectangle, there's 3.2 billion people that will never be able to call on the name of Jesus unless someone from outside of that rectangle goes and tells them about the name of Jesus. It, it makes up uh, all of northern Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and this is what it means when we say that a people group is unreached. Like it means that, I mean, they don't have a Bible in their back pocket, in their phone. They don't have a church on every single street corner. They don't know a Christian that lives in their community. God sends people to share the good news with, with people that don't even know that they need that good news. And so maybe you're wondering, okay, who, Alex, who are these people? Are these preachers? Is it missionaries? I would say yes. Like, of course. Like, yes, it's missionaries. Like, like Luke was talking about as he was sent to Africa. Yes, it's, it's pastors and preachers, vocational ministers. Sure. Yeah. But it's also regular Joes and Josephinas that are just part of the regular church. Like, that's who Paul's talking to. He's just talking to the Gentiles and, and Jews here. He's sending them out. And he, if he's sending the church at Rome out, then that means he's sending the church in Rogersville out. Right? One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, if you want to write this down and walk through this later on your own time, it's 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. And, and some of us probably have heard verse 17, which says, If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. And, that, and that's great. That's, that's awesome. But it gets even better the further that you read because Paul is trying to get us to understand that in, at an identity level, like we're ambassadors for the name of Christ. 
Like he's entrusted to us the precious message of the gospel that reconciles broken, sinful people back to the perfect father. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Like already, like this is an identity level truth, church. Like this isn't a leadership position. This isn't about power or a particular platform. He's already called you to be an ambassador, a spiritual leader. Man, this is good news, church. I've been praying all week that we as a church, we would like be able to like walk in that identity truth, that we would believe it here and act upon what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. I think a couple in our church that have been doing a really awesome job of, of living out the mission here at our church, which, by the way, is to equip and release spiritual leaders. That's you guys, by the way, to influence Southwest Missouri and the world for Christ. I love our mission statement. Because, it, I mean, it's Paul's mission statement. David and Carol Crawford, they're members of our church. And last week, they, they woke up to a terrible tragedy that occurred on their property. A car wreck that killed one of the passengers of the vehicle. It's devastated the entire Rogersville community. And David and Carol, they were able to, to open up their property, open up their land and host a vigil service and able to love on and pray for the grieving families and, and even be able to obey promptings of the Holy Spirit to share the name of Jesus, to talk about the story of salvation. Now, Carol and I got a chance to talk about this in my office this week. She said one of the conversations that she had was with a grieving friend. And she went down because this person was all by themselves I was listening to this person, loving on this person. And she asked, hey, do you know Jesus? Do you know him? Have you been saved by Jesus? Because she knows that, hey, I can only comfort this person temporarily speaking. But Jesus is the ultimate comforter, and he can save people eternally. And so she's obedient to ask a simple question that, it, I mean, he was met with, yes, like, yes, I, I know and, and follow Jesus. Maybe you've heard this quote in the past of like, hey, we should share the gospel at all times. And then if necessary, we should use words. And biblically speaking, like from this text, it's always necessary to use words. Okay, Alex, where is he sending me? To, to whom is he sending me to? And I would say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, like, I mean, maybe it's, it's somewhere on your property, like David and Carol. Maybe it's at the cubicle next to you, in your community around you. I don't know, some of us are going to go across the street. Some of us are going to go across the ocean. But he's sending us, he's calling us to preach this message, just to share this message of reconciliation to people that got to be reconciled back to a holy, perfect God. Hey, what if we believed like actually believed that sharing the gospel was not a burden, that it wasn't a bummer. Like this is not, this is not a bummer. Like this is a blessing to be able to witness all the things that God is doing. It's, it's actually for our joy and it's for our benefit that we get to participate in how God is bringing people back to himself. Fellowship, God is worthy of all worship from all of his creation. And in order for him to receive that worship, people have to believe, they have to call upon. And in order for them to believe, to call upon, they have got to hear. And in order for them to hear, we've got to go. We've got to go and talk about Jesus. Brutal fact number two, and just to be honest with you, brutal fact number two, it's probably more brutal than number one, which is people will hear and still not believe. People will hear the gospel and they still will not believe. Verse 16 says, but they have not all obeyed, or we could say they haven't all accepted the gospel. And Paul's heartbroken here. He's in anguish over Israel. I mean, he's quoting the prophet Isaiah. He's quoting the psalmist in Psalm 19. He's trying to illustrate just how defiant and disobedient and, and intentional Israel is being and rejecting the gospel message because he's trying to say, hey, you know how God's glory is shown throughout all of the world? And you know how that's obvious? Well, that's what it's been like to share the gospel with you. 
There wasn't a Jewish community at this time that had not heard the gospel time and time and time again. And yet they choose to refuse. They have no excuse. Paul was faced with this brutal reality that as he's trying to share the gospel, he's trying to be obedient, he's met time and time again with people that hear but don't believe. The same thing is true of of Isaiah. In my personal time with the Lord, over the last few months, I'm reading Isaiah. And to be honest with you, it's kind of like when Jim Collins was reading Stockdale's story. It's, It's depressing. I feel hopeless at times. And I know the end of the story. Or Moses, when he goes on top of the mountaintop, he meets God face to face, and he gets the Ten Commandments for Israel's flourishing. It's for their benefit. He's trying to help this people that he loves, and he comes down to these people worshiping a golden calf. Oh, he's faced with the brutal reality. Maybe you're facing this brutal reality. Like maybe some of you in this room, you're you're the very first believer in your family. Or you're the only believer in your family. These people that you love most, the people that you're, you're closest with, just hear but won't believe. And maybe you're even persecuted or ostracized because you're trying to share the life changing good news of the gospel that has so deeply changed your life. Hey, let's just call it what it is, can we? Like, the Paul's community that he's talking to is quite similar to our community here in southwest Missouri. Like, we say this a lot, that our area is church-saturated but gospel-starved. I mean, there's so many people that, that get the opportunity daily to respond to the gospel. There's people in southwest Missouri that that will go to every Christmas Eve service, their entire life, every Easter service, their entire life. They'll hear time and time again and still not believe. So why? Like, why, why in Paul's time? Why in our time and where we live? Like, why are people hearing and still choosing not to believe. I think that's what verse 19 is getting at. Well, is it because it's too complicated? No. We talked about that last week. <laughs> the gospel's simple. Understand, it's not so easy to accept, guys. It's, it's the pride of humanity to want to get this salvation thing on our own. That's why we, the Israelites, and that's why we as well, we perform for God's acceptance and approval Or we pretend that our sin is not that bad or not as bad as those people over there. We hide our sin from others. Just trying to preserve and act like there's something that we do that earns our own salvation. This week, Paul's pulling back another layer. And he's saying, hey, your pride goes deeper than that. Because you're looking down at these Gentiles people. You're too busy looking down at them that you won't look up at me. And see how unrighteous you are. See how unholy you are. See how in need of, of, of me you are and how helpless you are. So the question is, is I, I have for Paul and, and, and I have for us is, okay, if this is going to happen, like if people are going to hear and not believe, like what keeps us going? Like how do we maintain this vision? Like, like, like Paul's not done here. Like, he's still moving. He, he's still planting churches. Like, how does he keep going, and how do we keep going? Well, I got the opportunity to uh, talk to one of my best friends from Southeast Asia. His name's Travis. He, he's been sharing the gospel with non-believers for over 11 years, five years in America at the University of Arkansas, and six, six years in Southeast Asia. And I, and I confronted him, and I asked him, I said, Travis, I, I need to know... Just humbly speaking, because he would never obviously bring this up, I said, hey, it, conservatively, how many times do you think that you've shared the gospel without anyone believing, by the way? He said, uh, well over a thousand times. Well over a thousand times, over a decade, I've, I've shared the gospel with people that, that have heard and, and chosen not to believe and to people that that haven't yet heard and still choose not to call upon the name of Jesus. And I said, Travis, like, what keeps you going? Why are you still living over there? How are you going about doing this? His response is, Alex, I am just so taken with Jesus. There is really nothing else I'd rather do than to talk about Jesus, to talk about who he is 
and what he's personally done for me. I found total satisfaction in just obeying, being a part of God's plan. And, and hopes and having an unwavering faith that more and more people will come to know him eventually. Another way that we could say this is God will sometimes move through us, sure, but more importantly, I would say, and always, he moves in us when we take steps of faith to share our faith. Because here's the deal, if we share the gospel and someone comes to know Jesus, it's like, wow, we get to celebrate, We're like right here, and it's awesome, it's great. And whenever we do and we're rejected, guess what we get to do? We get to grieve. We have more compassion for this people. And so either way, you know what we get? We get intimacy with Jesus. It's not about accomplishing something for Jesus. It's about experiencing deeper intimacy with Jesus. And he's offering you an avenue to do this by sharing your faith. When we grow compassion for loved ones who have heard and continue to reject the gospel... We get more of Jesus. We become more and more like him. And we trust that there's no words that we could ever do or say that would save somebody. It's, it's the word of Christ, like the power is in the message of the gospel, nothing that, that we bring to the table. And then this leads us to our unwavering faith, that God's plan will prevail in the end. And this is maybe the best part because we, like Jim Collins, we get to just skip back. We get to go back to the end. We get to see how this thing ends. And, and it ends gloriously. The disciple John writes it down in a vision. He gets to see the curtain peeled back of what heaven and all of eternity is going to be like. He writes it down in Revelation 7. He says this, Behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they're clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Church, God's plan will prevail in the end. Amen? Come on, God's plan will prevail. This is amazing stuff. Like we already know the end of the story. He's inviting us to be a part of it now. And so here's, here's where Paul's at. In verse 20 and 21, we see this. Isaiah is bold enough to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those that did not ask for me. It's part of God's prevailing plan unfolding here. Verse 21 but of Israel, he says, all the day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. This is actually Paul trying to cast a compelling vision, trying to give them unwavering faith and, and hope because you know who he's talking to right now, right? This is amazing. He's talking to Gentiles that have finally heard and called upon the name of Jesus. Like, this is awesome. And at the same time, he's also talking to Jews that have heard over and over again, finally humbled themselves enough to call upon the name of Jesus. And so this church here of Jews and Gentiles is a walking miracle. Like, this is amazing. And we see Paul's personal experience, his personal testimony of being the most prideful Jew, maybe on earth, that tried harder than everybody to perform for his salvation and, and compared himself to others by pretending his sin wasn't so bad. And even the gospel was strong enough to change his heart. Paul's testimony and the church that he loves at Rome are evidence of God's plan prevailing. And this is the source of our unwavering faith too. This is our hope, our own personal testimonies. And, and our church our evidence of God's plan prevailing. That's why we, we go all out and we celebrate baptisms on Baptism Sunday. That's why we love our mission partners and, and we have a Mission Sunday and we talk about how we can be involved in God's plan all throughout the world. And even verse 21, although it can seem discouraging, it's actually a picture of God's steadfast love and grace extended to his people because he's still waiting for them patiently, more patient than we can imagine. I mean, he is like the father waiting for the, the prodigal son to return. He's, he's waiting, he's ready, he's, he's willing, 
whenever they humbled themselves enough to call on the name of his son, Jesus. We're going to even explain more evidence of God's unfolding plan next week when we talk about this remnant of Israel that will be saved. But for this week, I really just want to leave us with three reminders of what it can actually look like practically to be a part of God's prevailing plan right here in southwest Missouri and even participate for the world's sake. And so here's just three things that I found to be really helpful that I think would be great power in our church if we embrace this. One, we need to know our identity. And yeah, we need to know our identity as a, as a son and, and daughter of the king, 100%. And we, we need to know that we are an ambassador of Christ. Like, that's who we are. We are sent people. We are a church that's sent out. God has qualified you to talk about him. If you've experienced Jesus, you get to export Jesus. Man, I really have. I've been praying that there'd be people for the first time walk in confidence of that identity of being a spiritual leader here in our, area, in our area. Secondly, we need to know our story. We have to know it. I mean, some of us, maybe we've never actually taken time to, to write down and, and journal and process like how we came to know Jesus. And when we do that, like we get a, a greater intimacy with Jesus. Like, like this is an act of worship. And, and, and someday, maybe, God willing, he opens up a door for us to export that story to someone else. And it becomes someone else's story. God always turns our mess into a message and a ministry, a ministry of reconciliation. And lastly, we need to know the needs around us and we need to pray for them. And that starts with a person. Like, my question is, who's this person that, that the Holy Spirit's kind of prompted you to pray for during this morning? Or who's this people group that maybe you saw and thought of for the first time because we saw the world map that you could begin praying for now or, or a particular place? I mean, we begin to be involved in what God's doing across the world by simply praying that God would raise up more laborers into his harvest, and he's faithful enough to do that. And maybe, just maybe, when we pray those big prayers, God will raise us up as a laborer, joyfully, by the way, to enter into his harvest. Church, we can't miss this. Like, we must not confuse unwavering faith that God will prevail in the end, despite the most brutal facts that we're forced to face. And whenever we do that, like we get to see that God is using people all throughout our area and world to bring people into a saving relationship with them. And my question is like, why would you not want to be a part of that? Sharing the gospel is not a burden. It really is a blessing. I just want to pray that that would actually be true for us as a church this morning. So pray with me. Lord, I do pray that that would be true that my friends in this room would, would have a supernatural confidence, not in their words, but in your perfect word, the word of Christ, the gospel. I just pray that you would even begin right now in the hearts and minds of my friends to bring people to mind that need to be reconciled back to you, that need to, to be introduced to you who saves them. I pray for anyone in this room that doesn't know you, that has yet to call upon the name of your son Jesus, maybe they've heard countless times, I pray that this time, this Sunday, that they'd be obedient to trust you, treasure you, and surrender to you. We ask this in your name. Amen.